Good morning. And let me welcome you here to Ararat Baptist Church for our midweek service. Um, or if you're here this morning or if you're watching online, um, it's the same warm welcome to you. Let us worship today remembering that we have a God who is not distant and uncaring, but one who listens to his children's voices. Psalm 103 verses 1 to 4 says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. Let us pray as we come to God. Lord of light and life, we come to you this morning to seek your face <clears throat> and to encounter your love. So many things this week have distracted us, turned us aside or drowned out your voice. So we ask now that you call us to you once more. As we turn our faces to you, may our eyes blink at your brilliance and our hearts beat at your beauty, and our lives reflect your radiance. Open our hearts and minds to the new light you bring to us. Enlighten, convict, illuminate, and comfort each of us as you choose. Awake us from our slumber and provoke us to faith-filled action. And may we know that we have met you in this place. Amen. We're going to start this morning with a familiar hymn. It talks about um, the might of God, but also the mystery of God. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. surrounded by the beauty of creation um, but we see life and we see the death in the the trees changing and we see uh, in our own lives life and death before us 
Well, certainly at the moment, we're seeing on our television screens a lot, a lot of death, aren't we? A lot of things to make us mourn and um, confused, to make us perplexed. Um, and perhaps in your own lives as well. Um, and so in this mystery and this sadness and this confusion, let us bring all these things to God in prayer. Almighty God, who is creator of this incredible world that we live in, who is creator of the, of the rolling spheres and the, the starlit sky, the beauty that is around us, the seasons as they change, the new birth of the, the little babies and families that we rejoice with, but also the, the families that we see that have also lost people that they love. Lord, we rejoice when we know about um, people gathering together and working together and um, contributing and convening and so on, supporting each other. But then we see so much division in the world and we know that it must grieve your heart even more than it grieves ours. Lord, we bring to you the brokenness we see. The brokenness in our own lives, the brokenness in our, uh, our families, the brokenness in our country, the brokenness in the world. Lord, you are the mighty, all-powerful one, and yet you never use that power to beat people down, to snatch, to overrun, to kill, to maim, to drive apart. Lord, we grieve for the heartache that there is in the Middle East, in Ukraine, in Russia, in America, places in America and places in Far East. Lord, we are sorry. We're sorry for our own part in division. We're sorry for our own uh, partisanship, for our own judgmentalism, for our own lack of care. But Lord, we raise these situations up and ask you that you will intervene, that you will bring light into the hearts of people who at the moment seem to be in darkness. We ask you, Lord, to bring healing. We ask you, Lord, to bring forgetfulness of the sins of others and the hurt and the pain that's caused so that there may be a chance to build, to rebuild. We ask you for reconciliation. And we ask you, Lord, most of all, that you will work in our lives, that we may be <coughs> changed people and that we may be uh, active for change where we can. We ask this all for the sake of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our readings today are taken from Psalm 39 and from Mark chapter 10. First of all, Psalm 39, verses 1 to 7 and the verse 12. I said to myself, I will watch what I do and not sin in what I say. I will hold my tongue when the ungodly are around me. But as I stood there in silence, not even speaking of good things, the turmoil within me grew worse. The more I thought about it, the hotter I got, igniting a fire of words. Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. We are merely moving shadows, and all our busy rushing ends in nothing. We heap up wealth, not knowing who will spend it. And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cries for help. Do not ignore my tears, for I am your guest, a traveller passing through, as my ancestors were before me. And from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 27. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Fraud. Honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared. All these I have kept since I was a boy. <coughs> Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Amen. They say it's a matter of perspective. How close to reality is the way we look at things? For we can view the same scene from different positions, from within or from the outside, from above or below, looking forward to it or looking back on it, personally involved or dispassionately, in support of one team or the other, isn't that a fact? And the conclusions we would come to it, to it about it would be completely different. Or like one of those detective shows. Do you watch detective shows on the television? And the writers are very clever, aren't they? Because as the story goes on, they drop little clues in. 
And all through the show, if you're anything like me, you say, oh, I know who did it. I picked up that clue. I know who did it. I know who's guilty. And then as the show comes on a bit further, something else, and you say, oh, no, it wasn't him. It was, it was her. <laughs> I know who did it. And then you go right the way through to the end, and you find yourself with conclusions until the last moment when you get everything revealed and everything is not actually as you thought it was. And the guilty person is totally twisted. It, it's, not, it's not the person you thought at all because you have all the information produced in a different way. Sometimes the path before us is a complete mystery, isn't it? A complete fog. Or it's like one of those pictures that they get on the internet where they say that there are lots of different dots and shapes and everything. And they say, if you look at this and you unfocus your eyes a bit, you'll see some shapes coming out of it. Have you seen those? Well, you know, sometimes you do and sometimes you look at it and you can do funny things with your eyes and you'll never see a shape. All you'll still see is squiggles. That's life, isn't it? Life can be very perplexing at time, times, including for the believer. In Psalm 39, we are reading a song or a prayer of lament. It's honest ponderings by David as he tries to understand life and how to work out practically and emotionally how to live out his faith. How is he to make sense of what's happening to him and to those around him? the good or bad people, the rich or poor, the successful or the failures. It seems he's tried doing the right thing in the public domain, watching his tongue. In fact, it sounds as if he's watched it so, so much that he didn't say anything at all. Yet even that doesn't settle his dissatisfaction. His heart, his motion, spirit, all seem churned up by this frustration and a sense of pointlessness, powerlessness and impermanence. Have you ever felt like that? He says, what's the point of spending all your time running around trying to make a name for yourself or a pension stash when even with the best healthcare plans, none of us can even guarantee the length of our lives. And even while our life continues, there are times when things happen to us that make us wonder, perhaps, is God making a point? Is he angry with us? Is he treating us harshly because we need to be taught a lesson about our failures? Or just to show how powerful he is and, and much more powerful than we are? And we have no right to question what he decides. Have you been tempted to think like that? Is that the kind of God that David believed in? From these words that we get in the psalm, it appears, on the other hand, that David believes that God actually is the proper person to get knowledge from. He's the one who actually knows what's going on. He's the one who is the provider and sustainer of life. He's the one who has it all at hand. And he also believes that he is vulnerable to judgment in the dealings of God. He says, our lives are brief and we are like moving shadows. Somewhere else it says that with God there is no shadow of turning, but we are like moving shadows. I sometimes think there's a shadow side to us, isn't there? That's not, you can't always depend on us, can you? Now that's funny, isn't it? Because David, wasn't he one of the good guys? Wasn't he one of God's people? In fact, even more than that, wasn't he the anointed king of God's people? Wasn't he the one that they talked about being a man after God's heart? And yet, even in David's estimation, he dwelt with God as a foreigner a stranger, an alien, it says in one, in one of the translations, an alien. I suppose a lot of people, particularly right-wing politicians, would say, he was an illegal. Don't trust those illegals. 
Isn't it, isn't it a fact? David thought he was one that you would be suspicious of. Not one of the good guys. It's a slight change, isn't it? That he knew he needed help from God to live as God wanted him to live, as God would desire him to live. He needed God's insight and he needed God's help in order to bring hope to his life. Now let's jump to the other reading, all right? I'm not going to go any further with the David one for a minute. Let's move over to the Mark reading. Now that's about a young man, rich young man, who comes to see Jesus. And now remember who Jesus is. Jesus is the son of God, the third person of the Trinity. And that's who Jesus believed he was, okay? And the young man comes to see Jesus and he wants to ask him how to earn eternal life. And the young man comes up and calls the calls Jesus good teacher. Now, was he using just by civil uh, flattery, you know, let's, let's address Jesus in the right way, you know, use the right words. So he comes up and he calls him good teacher. Had he reasoned it out why he used the word good teacher? What's the first thing that Jesus does in answering him? Puts his finger on that straight away. Why did you call me good? No one's good except God. Now, we don't get any follow-on from that little bit of comment that Jesus men makes, but he's, it's almost as if Jesus put gently, very gently, put a little finger on a sore patch. You, you've come up and you said, good teacher, why did you call me good? No one's good. But God. And then we get the rest of the story. Jesus says, you've come up to ask me, what must I do to earn eternal life? And Jesus directs the man's attention to the law. Why the law? Well, that's what they believed was their way of getting a good standing before God. So the law, main things of the law are listed. And the, man's, the young man's mentally ticking them off. He was probably, um, or possibly, polishing his fingernails at that point. Nice warm glow on his face. He knew he'd done all those things. And Jesus looks at him and smiles. Well, it was impossible not to love the guy. He was so earnest. He was so apparently up for it. Being a good person. Carefully ticking off all the boxes for his security in this life. And he hoped the next. Jesus, I guess looking at the heart rather than the tick boxes, looked for where his sense of security truly lay. And he chose to test it in two ways. He asked, or he, he tested in his asking, what he next says, would he still feel secure if he handed his hoarded resources over to embrace a wider understanding of God's provision of his daily needs? Listen to that again. Would he still feel secure if he handed his hoarded resources over to embrace a wider understanding of God's provision of his daily needs? Now, this young man, he was rich. He was rich in a in an era when people didn't have riches. Daily life was just scraped by. So for him to, and they were in a, remember they're in an occupied country, taxed heavily. For him to have some money, extra money, hoarded riches, he either has to be kind of, I don't know, bucking the trend a bit, perhaps paying his workers not too much. He has to be kind of working with the occupying nation a bit. He has to be turning a blind eye, really, to the people around him living in poverty. He's having more than his daily needs. 
in a sense, he's, why, well, why do we do all these things? We do them because they make us feel safe. Why do we all gather things around us? They make us feel safe. Why do we gather emotional stability around us? Because it makes us feel safe and secure. He said, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor. What? Well, the poor have daily needs as well. Let go of some of that hoarded resources. Would you still feel safe if you let go of some of those hoarded resources and cared for those poor around you? He's testing the young man. You, you pray, give, give us each day our daily bread. Would you feel secure with just your daily needs sorted? Or do you need security in your hoarded resources? And also, there's this perception of your understanding of those, that law. How wide is your understanding of that law? So there's that. But secondly, he's kind of basing his security on the fact that he thinks he's good in himself. David didn't think you could be good in yourself. The only person who's good is God. In which case, you need a saviour. You need a God who provides you with the goodness. So, the second thing he says is, he says, go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, then come and follow me. Get my insight on security. Get my insight on what living life to the full is about. Was he prepared to do that? Would he still feel secure if his sense of righteousness was achieved not by his own efforts, but merely by his intimate relationship and direct guidance by the truly righteous one, the God one, the source of all goodness, mercy, justice, and love. Because that's what he was being asked to do. And that's quite a big thing, isn't it? To realise that it's not actually about your goodness, but about the self-giving intervention of the God who is not just loving, but love itself. Not just compassionate, but the spring of compassion. Not only fair, but the arbiter of complete justice. Not resourcer of an in-group, but provider of all. I think that's why we, that's what we hear in Jesus' frustration in his conversation with those who came to him simply, excuse me, simply seeking more bread to eat following his feeding of the 5,000. Or alternatively, some sort of proof of his authority to be like Moses, who they perceived as the giver of heavenly bread and issue more rules. Instead, he assured them that he himself was the provision from God, the bread of life, freely offered to be broken apart, taken into theirs, the way to be given life and sustained daily. And you know, I have the feeling that this is a sense in which Jesus offered his disciples the pattern prayer that we regularly use, the Lord's Prayer that we prayed earlier. That's what he had in mind, and not just I'm not saying he didn't intend us to use the words, but not only use the words. He is to be, Jesus himself is to be our chief cornerstone, our stabiliser, our strength giver, our line straightener. Have a listen. From the very first words of the prayer, our, the same for us all. Every single one of us. None of us are the good guys and those are the bad guys. All of us. Father. It's an intimate parental carer and provider for the sake of the helpless. If you will not come as a little child, one who has no rights, no privileges, you may not come at all. In heaven, the God who is entirely other to us 
and the complete source of um, source and creator of all means we don't need to understand everything. We don't need to know why about everything or how or how things fit up. We just, we just need to know that it was God. Hallowed be your name. May God be the place that demands our respect, our reverence, the weight of our dependence. Not lesser idols of the world. What does it matter about them? God is the one who's in control. May your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, may our lives be directed or molded such that they closely follow or closely mirror Jesus' way of relating or doing things. Like the old-fashioned disciple walking so close to his teacher that they were covered with the dust from his sandals. Give us our daily, this day our daily bread. Develop in us a sense of what we really need and not what will be a distraction or a needless burden. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. In other words, create in us a passion for seeking reconciliation even in the face of opposition and your deep walk alongside compassion for those who struggle just as we do. You see, this is a completely different relationship with God that we are being invited into, that we will enjoy life in its fullness, the kind of relationship that Jesus knew. And that was the relationship that he was prepared to rest himself on. That's where you know eternal life and eternal peace. That was the life, that was their relationship where he could go to sleep in a boat when there's a storm. That was the relationship he had where he prayed in the night in the Garden of Gethsemane. That was the relationship where he trusted his spirit to his father on the cross. The question is, do you trust him enough to find out? Or can you trust yourself not to? Amen. Our final hymn is Through All the Changing Scenes of Life in Trouble or in Joy. Let's. said through Isaiah, fear not, 
for I am with you. I will strengthen you, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Lord, help me to live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help me to give my, myself away to others, being kind to everyone I meet. Spirit, help me to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all I do and say, Amen. Amen. Now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, rest and abide upon you and grant you his peace this day and forevermore.